Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the webinar on how to protect your IP at Trade Fairs internationally. I'm very happy today uh, because we have uh, several team members of uh, the IP Help Desk. The IP Help Desk is an initiative from the European Commission, which I will share a bit more information after. Uh, so first of all, I'm Benoit. I'm the IP business advisor of the Southeast Asia IP SME Help Desk, and I will also be today moderator, trying to uh, lead a bit the discussion. Here, a quick reminder of the housekeeping rules for Zoom. I guess after COVID now, everyone knows how to use it, but if you have any issue, please feel free to let us know. The most important is the Q&A feature, uh, because we will have a Q&A discussion Q&A session at the very end of this uh, webinar. So feel free to ask any question related to uh, trade fairs, related to IP, to one of the regions uh, that will be discussed today. Uh, without further ado, here is the speakers that we will have today. Uh, we have Enrique Fontes uh, from the uh, EA, the European Exhibition Industry Alliance. Uh, then we'll have also Mr. Girish, uh, IP expert from the Latina, uh, the India, India IPSME help desk, joined also by a colleague, uh, Cesar Elvira Fernandez, uh, Latin America help desk, and last but not least, uh, Lisa Lu, uh, IP expert from the China IP help desk. Um, so these are the three speakers we will have, plus myself, sharing a bit of information on Southeast Asia. Uh, here we have the agenda for today. Uh, a lot of different things have to be discussed because we are talking about a very trendy topic, uh, especially after the COVID times that everyone is now attending trade fairs. So just to give a bit of information about the International IPSME Help Desk. So can we go to the next slide? So yes, basically we are an initiative of the European Commission and we are here to uh, provide help for internationalization of European SMEs. We provide information on how to protect, how to manage, how to enforce intellectual property rights in very specific regions and countries. Uh, today we have uh, India, we have Latin America, China, and Southeast Asia, but so you need to know that there are also two other help desks um, part of this beautiful program which are Africa and also Europe Help Desk. You can see on this slide that we offer a very large range of services. All these services are free of charge, uh, intended just aimed to European SMEs, but also to uh, multipliers, stakeholders, like chambers of commerce, like uh, business associations. We collaborate, for example, with uh, um, MECA, EAA. So we're very happy to have Enrique today. And on this slide, you can see, uh, well, we went a bit fast, uh, that we do trainings like today, it can be on site, can be virtual, it can be uh, also uh, mixed, hybrid. We have a lot of guides and fact sheets. This is the most important part because uh, these are taking a lot of time from all the, the teams. Uh, it's, they are written in, uh, in English, very easy to understand. And of course, if you have any question after reading these guides, uh, each of the teams, each of the help desk are very happy, would be very happy to reply to your questions. Well, last but not least, we have a very nice website gathering all the help desk, and then you will have a very specific uh, part of this uh, website for each help desk. A lot of information available on this, so I really, um, suggest that you should check after the webinar uh, this uh, this website and also register to the newsletter of each of the help desk or at least the regions that you're interested in. Without any further ado, I think it's uh, almost time to jump into a beautiful uh, webinar. I hope it will be interactive. I remember that I remind you that if you have any question, we will have uh, time at the end to discuss. And today it's very important because trade fair is, let's say, the first part of industry uh, internationalization. Uh, when a company goes to a trade fair, is to showcase the products, is to discuss with partners. 
a lot of things, a lot of uh, tips will be shared today. And so I'm, we are happy to begin this session with uh, Enrique Fontes, legal advisor for EA. Uh, if you want to introduce yourself and the floor is yours, Enrique. Thank you very much, Benoit. Thank you very much for having invited EMECA, the European Major Exhibition Centers Association and the European Exhibition Industry Alliance. Uh, and, and also uh, for having invited to me. I have been a generalist a lawyer for Feria Valencia. Then uh, I mean that I'm not a real specialist in, in IP, although I have been involved in this uh, field for a, a lot of years. I, uh, what I am actually are is a, an specialist in trade first, a lawyer specialist in trade first. It has corresponded to me uh, to introduce the topic IPR and international first. And I would like to start by remarking that the intellectual property legal framework is necessarily a modern and dynamic legal, legal framework due to the rapid evolution of technology and scientific advance. National and international lawmakers are constantly being challenged uh, by new technological developments and scientific findings. And consequently, the intellectual property law has to catch up uh, with those advances in order to respond to the needs or, uh, of innovation uh, and the needs of innovative people and innovative companies. To illustrate it with a couple of, of examples, we can talk about biotechnology and uh, software. Uh, are, uh, biotechnology and software are fields that have especially been challenged uh, uh, by the, the developments in the, in the industry. And uh, lawmakers in the last decades uh, have had the obligation to try to clarify what is patentable or not in those uh, so complicated areas. And more recently, the new developments on artificial intelligence and on a new concept that has come to us, the metaverse, have arrived to create new in, in, in material spaces where it is possible to carry out activities uh, where people and, and companies have the possibility to establish relationships and even register brands and designs. Another idea that I, I had to remark is that IP law uh, is different from one country to another. Other international convention uh, have harmonized national laws in uh, many aspects. But what is inter intellectual property? We can say that intellectual property is the product of the mental effort of a person. Uh, in the intellectual property is then an intangible asset. Knowledge, know-how, uh, the ability to innovation can be, uh, for many companies, the most uh, valuable assets uh, in a company. Uh, and then the idea is to transform this immaterial capital into tangible benefits. And here is where intellectual property right plays an important, an important uh, role. IPR is the legal instrument that allows um, uh, to protect the, the, these intangible assets of a person of, or of a company. IP uh, helps protecting immaterial creation by giving its creator an exclusive right uh, to it. The intellectual property right allows its creator to decide who can use them and how they can be used. And therefore, uh, uh, the, the IP holder can control other people's access to the product uh, generated by their activity and finally uh, obtaining a benefit from them. Therefore, uh, the protection of intellectual property can enable IP holders to capture the return on their investment and prevent other, others from benefiting from their hard work. Obtaining relevant uh, property rights and uh, the, its maintenance can discourage potential offenders and turn ideas into business assets with a real business, business value. Um, I would like also to remember that entrepreneurs are frequently the driving force uh, behind innovation. And often uh, they make substantial in financial investment to develop intellectual property 
in the form of new products and new processes, brand, et cetera. And according to statistics, um, uh, we can say that it's a proven fact that companies that recognize the value of their intellectual property and dedicate time and resources to protect uh, their intangible assets are uh, as part of the a business strategy can increase their competitiveness in different ways. And in certain cases, they can achieve a leadership position within the productive sector. On the contrary, ignoring uh, the, the company's intellectual property opens the possibility that other competitors will take advantage of their technical innovations, their ideas of business, their goodwill and their reputation in the markets. But this webinar is about intellectual property, but in the context of international trade fairs. And that leads me to remind that the intellectual property rights are specific to each country and limited to its territory. And that they exist and can be exercised only within the jurisdiction of the state or states under which the law are granted. For this reason, uh, I would like to say that one of the first decisions that the inventor or the IP, IP holder will have to make is uh, the, geographical, the geogra geographic area in which the inventor uh, must seek protection for, uh, for his invention. Uh, the creator should assess the location and the scope of the market for the products. And generally, generally speaking, uh, the higher the number of countries where the request, your, your request protection, the, high, the higher the cost. But uh, what, happened in, what happens in many cases is that the owner of the, of a, of the right, uh, who is based, uh, for example, in India or in Vietnam, has protected his uh, IPR in a certain geographical area, Southeast Asia, for example, and wishes to expand his commercial activity to other countries, for example, by part participating in foreign, foreign fairs, let's say in Europe, Germany, France, Italy, or Spain. For these cases, uh, the Paris Union Agreement, uh, dated on 1883, in its Article 4, already contemplated the Union Priority Right, which provides that an applicant uh, from one contracting state shall be able to use its first filing date uh, in one of the contracting states as the effective filing date in another contracting state, provided that uh, the applicant uh, files a subsequent applicant application within six months, in the case of uh, industrial designs and trademarks, or uh, 12 months in the case of patent, uh, patents on and utility models from the, the first uh, filing. Uh, then we have, um, we have to differentiate if we talk about uh, patents, we talk about designs, we talk about uh, trade uh, um, trademarks, or we talk about utility models because the grace period that the, the, the union priority right uh, recognize is, is different. 12 in the case of uh, patents, uh, six in the, in the case of designs and and, uh, and marks, three marks. This mechanism it can be really useful if we have registered a national patent and later we decide to attend a fair abroad our, our country. But we have to, to, be, to be cautious, we have to, uh, um, to be aware if uh, the countries in, uh, where we have registered uh, the, the, the first file is a member party of the, the Paris uh, Union Agreement. Uh, and also if the country where we, we want to expand our, our acti commercial activity is, is also a member of uh, the, uh, the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is dated on 1883, but it has been uh, several, uh, several times renewed. And uh, if, I don't, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong, uh, the last time it was in, in 1973. Although in, the, in 1980, uh, there were a, a group of uh, new countries that acceded to, the, to the, this, this legal uh, framework. 
The relevance of uh, fairs and exhibitions in the field of uh, industry property is evident from my point of view. Exhibitions uh, have been and continue to be a privileged channel for presentation of novelties and also for the achievement of commercial agreements. Fairs and, and exhibitions are an optimal channel for uh, the commercialization of products because they are spaces for public attendance and maximum, maximum dissemination of ideas and products, which at the same time makes them appropriate places for third parties to take advantage of the creative effort of others. I mean, piracy and counterfeiting. For this reason, uh, the Paris Union Agreement, the, the same uh, legal instrument to which I had referred before, in addition to the union priority right, contemplates in its Article 11, the right of priority for exhibition at fairs, which grants those who have presented novelties at official recognized international fairs a temporary protection of six uh, months. It means that uh, uh, if you have not uh, taken the, um, uh, you, you have not been careful registering a, a trademark, a, a design, or a patent before attending a fair, you still have the possibility to, uh, to request a trade fair organizers the uh, expedition of a certificate saying that you have presented, presented this product or this trademark in during the fair. And this document is going to be very, very uh, useful for you in order to, uh, to patent the product or to, to register the, the, uh, the trademark or the, the design. But uh, this protection, uh, the protection that the Union of Paris uh, recognized to products exhibited at first is limited to uh, some kind of uh, exhibition, some kind of uh, trade fairs. It has to be an official trade fair, I mean, the unofficial trade fair is an, uh, a trade fair that has been organized by uh, the state or by a public entity. And it can also be uh, an officially recognized exhibition. Uh, an officially, rec officially recognized exhibition is a, a trade fair that is not organized by the state, but the state recognizes uh, this exhibition in uh, the yearly published calendar uh, by the, uh, published by the, the Minister of Commerce in the, in the case of Spain, uh, the Minister of the Industry in Italy and, and other countries in, in, in Europe at least. If, uh, we can uh, obtain this protection at national level, we can obtain this protection at international level. At national level, um, the the patent and uh, trademark offices in, in Europe, at least, they, they don't, don't put any problems uh, at the time to recognize this certification. This, this certification. Um, when we speak about international trade fairs, uh, we take into account the standards of the UFI, or the uh, Union de Foire Internationale, the Global Association for the uh, Exhibition Industry. And the requirements that are taken into account in order to um, uh, grant this protection from the point of view of national uh, patent and trademark agencies is that the number of uh, direct, direct foreign exhibitors is at least 10% of the total or that foreign visitors do not, do not represent less than 5% of the total number of um, visitors. At this respect, I would like, I would like to say, but I will not go into depth because it's a, there is a controversy uh, with the European Union um, uh, uh, IP office in, in Alicante. There is a controversy because uh, when the regulation about designs and trademarks uh, for community designs and for European trademarks, um, they. Uh, make a distinction because uh, in international trade fairs, according to the, regu the European regulation, only uh, exhibitions that uh, are considered universal exhibitions uh, in the terms of the 
Paris Agreement of 1928, don't uh, mix with the, the other Paris Agreement uh, dated of, on 1883. Uh, they consider that um, uh, this uh, trade are not considered international, and then uh, they don't they don't accept the certification of uh, exhibition and trade fairs in order to uh, facilitate the, re the registration of designs. But uh, well, I will not go uh, on that uh, about this topic, but uh, in, in, if any of the attending, uh, attending people uh, is interested in the developments uh, in this controversy, you can provide my email and I will be happy to to answer uh, about this uh, this issue. Well, I'm, I think I'm going to, to stop here because I don't want to go uh, uh, to all, all over the, the topics that are going, are going to be introduced by my other colleagues uh, in, in the other speech. Thank you very much, Enrique. So we had the presentation of IP basics, also the link with trade fairs, uh, very technical already, some technical details that maybe we can discuss later on or if anyone has questions. Now I uh, will jump to Girish uh, from the uh, India uh, help desk, and he will explain us, let's say, the basic IP strategy before attending trade fairs. Girish, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Benoit, and uh, thank you, Enrique. Uh, and uh, all of you right now, I think so, Enrique has just laid out the platform explaining uh, what trade fair is and uh, the basic forms of IP and what you need to be concerned about. Uh, the first thing that we as IP help desk would uh, recommend for any SMEs who'd want to attend uh, a trade fair is to conduct an IP audit per se, an internal audit before attending the trade fair uh, within an organization or an enterprise. As you know, there are different kinds of intangible assets which the companies have, and it is always better to categorize them and have and make sure that all the intangible assets that you have are in some way protected. Uh, so as uh, Enrique had mentioned, the main forms of IP concerning uh, trade fairs might be patents, trademarks, designs, and copyrights. So in the image on, on the slide, if you see, there's an image of a circle and a C. This represents a copyrighted uh, Copyright per se need not be registered. So before attending a trade fair, we would suggest that you have the symbol on all your literary works, be it manuals, brochures, software, pictures, or anything that you would want to present in the, in the trade fair. Uh, you categorize these items and have this image so that uh, this per se provides you a right though you have not registered uh, any of this. So copyright per se need not be registered. The other image is having uh, a TM mark, which is basically saying that you would want to trademark your uh, brand, uh, the logo of your company. And if you've already done that, if you already have a registered trademark, then you can have a symbol of R. And if you have certain uh, technical features that uh, are patented within your product. You can have a patent pending symbol on your product or the patent granted number. So this one, having this categorization and the symbols on your products would already prevent you from, um, in case of an infringement, you have certain rights. Uh, the second thing that you would also Advice is just uh, as uh, Enrique mentioned, just make sure that uh, you have an IP office in the trade fair that you are visiting. This might not be true or throughout all geographies. Not all uh, trade fairs do have IP offices, but if there is an IP office, you can uh, provide uh, the certain certificates that you have, registration certificates and other products, the novel products that you're bringing into the trade fair, you can have it uh, documented with them. Uh, this might per se again help you uh, in case of uh, protecting your uh, product later on, in case of patent filing or in case of infringements. 
And uh, Enrique passingly mentioned about uh, novelty. This, I think, so will also be talked more about uh, this uh, by my colleague Cesar. So I will uh, not speak much about this right now. Uh, and the final thing is, as Enrique mentioned, uh, IP is per se territorial. So whichever trade fair that you are visiting to, it would always be a good idea to strategize prior to have certain notaries or certain advocates from that particular geography and have a kind of a consultative advice from them uh, because there are uh, different geographies and uh, the laws are pretty different. So it is always better to have some local guidance. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Post this, I will just uh, briefly talk about uh, the different kinds of IP rights that we have. Uh, as most of you might be aware of, uh, and uh, spoken by Enrique also, that patents is one of the main uh, forms of intellectual property rights, which grants you a protection of 20 years to protect your technical innovations. That is per se, the functionality of your product. If you have a technical feature within your product, this can be protected through patents. And how can you protect your uh, patents? There is an international route. So if you have a patent within, uh, say, Spain, you have, a, you have a product, which is an invention, and you want to protect it uh, throughout uh, different uh, geographies, be it China or India. So there is an international route through, which is known as uh, Patent Cooperation Treaty through the PCT Treaty. So, which are which has over 157 contracting states. So, with a single filing of a patent application with uh, an organization known as World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, you can have your invention protected in different geographies. So, this is one international route available to protect your functionality of the product through patents. Coming to copyrights. As I uh, basically said, all your uh, technical manuals and other things that you would want to provide and uh, want to showcase in your trade fair, per se, this need not be registered. Copyright is granted automatically, so there is no per se registration required. But again, uh, it is different according to geographies. In most of the countries, registration is not required. Is uh, but uh, as mentioned. Uh, in few of the countries, such as Macau, Brunei, Singapore, registration might be required. Um, copyright per se is a faster means of protection, and it's also cheaper than uh, other IP rights, uh, which patents, which literally take uh, up to two years to get your right protected. So copyright is an automatic protection granted. The next slide down. And uh, the other two important intellectual properties that we have uh, are designs. Designs are used to protect the external features of your product, be it the ornaments, the design, um, the color shape of the product. This can be protected through design protection and you get uh, a design right uh, granted to up to 15, 10 plus five years in India. And again, it varies from country to country. For designs, there is an international system where you can uh, uh, provide a single design application and uh, protect it in different regions, but many countries are not part of it. There are only 79 uh, contracting parties. India is not one. China recently is in the Hague system. So this is one good thing. And in Latin America, the two major markets being Brazil and Mexico are part of the international uh, route to protect your designs. Uh, in Southeast Asia, as you see, Brunei, Cambodia, Singapore, uh, and Vietnam have the international means, international route to protect your designs. So again, you have to bifurcate over here. Patent is for the functionality and design protection is for the external features of the product, the color, shape, and size, and other features that you have. Coming to the last, uh, one of the main uh, important forms of intellectual property known as trademarks to protect your brand, your logo, 
and the association of a product with your brand. Trademark is basically to protect the product that you have and you, for the consumer, is able to associate that product with the logo or the mark of your company, of your enterprise. Trademark protection, again, there is an international route available. So with a single trademark uh, application, you can protect your logo or mark across different uh, countries um, through the Madrid system with over 130 countries, which are part of the Madrid system, India, China, I think so, and most uh, countries in Southeast Asia and uh, Latin America are part of uh, the Madrid agreement. So this is a means which uh, European SMEs can take easily to protect their trademarks across different geographies uh, in the world prior to attending uh, the trade fair. Uh, you should keep in mind that all of this is being discussed as an uh, ex ante measure before attending the trade fair. So having categories of the intangibles within your asset and making sure that you have different means adopted to protect this different intangibles in your uh, enterprise. This is very important before going to the trade fair. Now, to strategize or what happens in the trade fair, uh, I would hand over the floor to Cesar, who would uh, explain uh, the steps to take within the trade fair when you are there in the trade fair. Thank you. That's right. Thank you very much, Girich. In fact, yes, I'll be covering the main IP concerns when attending trade fairs. And as we all know, the biggest one is figuring out that your competitors have fancier business cards, right? <laughs> No, it's not. I'm afraid, no. It's not meeting the dress code. But jokes aside, those that you can see there are what we believe, based on experience, what entrepreneurs like you fear the most when going to trade fairs. The first one, I came here to show my new products. Am I safe? Is one of the most frequently asked questions. And all this in me is want a simple, straightforward answer. Are you safe? Well, it mostly depends on how diligent you've been. If you did what Gears recommended, there's nothing to worry about. But if not, you might be in trouble, particularly if the products you are showing might involve some patentable technology or protectable design. Because if you did not perform the freedom to operate, then you might be infringing someone else's rights. Or you might be hindering the novelty of those creations, hence closing yourself the doors of ulterior patents or designs. And this happens at many levels, not only on big stage presentations. Because remember that the state of the art, which is why the patent examiner checks to see if your invention is real new, is composed by anything made public in any part of the world by any means. And this includes, of course, the webinars, the LinkedIn posts, or simply the sliding presentation at your booth, be that video, pictures, or catalogs. And now that... A um, at least uh, I hope so, you're a little bit scared, it's the right moment for you to know that this might not be so dramatic thanks to two mechanisms. First, the grace period. Because contrary to Europe, you got it in China, which stands for six months, also in India for 12 months, and Latin America for 12 months too, as well as in Southeast Asia, which varies for, to, from six to 12 months. This is really, really good because it gives you an extra period from disclosure to apply for this design or patent applications without being rejected for the disclosure in this type of events. Now, the second mechanism is that you also have this the so-called non-prejudicial disclosures exception, which is what we used to in Europe. So if you are evidently abused or are participating in an official exhibition, then you can keep your potential patent alive for 12 months. Now, the point is that you must check if the event at hand is on the list of those official exhibitions and get some official certificates of your participation, including very specific details about what you're disclosing. So you can hardly improvise it, but it's something to bear in mind. And as a bonus, you also can claim against the infringer for unfair competition under the anti-unfair competition law. But this is just an exception for unregistered IP rights which is pretty odd. For example, in China, it does apply, but in other countries, it does not work that good. Okay. 
Now, you might be used to this type of events, and for some reason, you went there, nothing happened so far, good for you. And you might also be accustomed to the European standards and take for granted that, for example, your designs are protected, just like that. And if we're talking about the aesthetic aspects of your products, not the technical features, as Giris mentioned, that's right. But that's because we, in Europe, have legal protection for unregistered designs. Three years from disclosure in Europe against identical designs. You won't be able to extend the protection up to 25 years, but that's another story. Well, in other regions, this does rarely exist. In fact, only in some countries in Central America happens. So go do your homework and apply for registration before you attend the event, as Gary said, or keep it undisclosed for the moment. And speaking about keeping it secret, this might be part of your IP strategy or your IP pro protocol, especially if you have some trade secrets, that's good. What happens then if you meet a potential partner or a distributor? Because that's exactly what you came here for. Stick to the plan. That's my advice. Because over-disclosure is very tempting. I know, especially if you're in front of a big fish. But please don't. You should have also identified the relevant information, the different levels you can get into depending on the counter's party's interest, and how you're going to display it. This is really, really important. And then, if you can, then, then just slide the non-disclosure agreement in. But remember two things. First, they must include some IP clauses, because templates and general NDAs usually don't have them, or are insufficiently specific, or they don't simply fit you. And second, it is just binding between the signatory parties. This person you meet, and you. So if you intend to use it to prevent other from registering the unprotected IP rights of yours, just bear in mind that they might not apply for a trademark in the destination country, for example, regarding your company's names, it's very limited because some friend of this person or some partner might do it. They're not affected. Might they do that? Sure. Then you can try to bet your best to prove the nullity action that happened there, and, but it will take some money and time anyway. So also just bear in mind that this nullity action for benefit registration is simply not guaranteed regardless of the evidences that you have. So you better include also some penalty clauses to discourage others from doing so. And in addition to that, of course, you must keep your eyes open and see if there's any hint of potential or actual infringement. Was the meeting casual or did you agree that in advance? If, if, that's ca if it's casual, how come they know so much about you? Why so much insistence on additional information or the worst case scenario? Why refusing to sign the non-disclosure agreement? Well, it takes me to the final biggest concern. It is, they copied me, why should it do now? First, just calm down. That's normal, trade fairs, do really provide lots of opportunities. For example, for learning more about innovation and to discover new potential business partners. That's good. And believe it or not, in this context, you might find some infringements in some infringers that might turn into partners in a medium term, but only if you know how to handle it. They might be doing it on purpose, or they might be doing that in good faith as it may happen to you otherwise. In any case, this is the time for evidence gathering so you can have a strong negotiation position and lay the foundations for ulterior legal actions, as we're going to see next. But be aware of a minor detail. You cannot claim that you have been infringed if you do not own anything. In other words, you can only enforce your IP rights if you legally register them. Now, the second step to enforce is to collect a significant volume and quality of evidence. Besides pictures and videos and all the promo materials of the infringers you can take, you could also record conversations, but only by lawful means, of course. And I'd also recommend visiting other booths, especially during the setup stage, so you can really have a more precise idea of what's going on. And if you aim to prove the damage, so you can ask for some kind of compensation, 
you need some more specific data, like for example, the price list, some sales performance uh, or distribution network of the infringing products or the size of the exhibition booth or the location of the booth at the trade fair. You got the picture. You could always do that yourself, but notarized evidence has a stronger probative force and it is more likely to be accepted by court, by the way. The classic ones are two. Notarized purchases, for example, just purchasing a sample infringing product was accompanied by a public notary and notarized photographies, like taking photos of the, at the trade fair of the infringer's exhibitions booth or the infringing products or the exhibits of infringing advertisement, all with a public notary by your side. So as you can see, it's not that complicated. And if you are proactive, the better. Because my advice is that you should be very proactive. No, everything is going to be okay. You follow these steps. But if not, an infringement goes wrong, then pay attention because that's exactly what Lisa is going to talk about next. Lisa? I think yeah. Lisa, you have... You're um, muted, Lisa. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so now I'm going to discuss with you uh, what you do if you identify potential infringement in a trade fair, uh, what enforcement actions you can take, and what the differences between different actions are, and what region specific information is shown. Next slide, please. So usually after identifying the infringement during the trade fair, the first action many companies will come out with is filing a complaint to trade fair immediately. However, in trade fairs in Southeast Asia and India, there are no trade fair representatives or another more common name, intellectual property claim that. So this option doesn't work. And even though you can file a complaint with your intellectual property claim that, at the trade fair, it may not be the best option for the following reasons. Like if your rights are not entirely in order, or if the case of the infringement is arguable, or if you have not preserved evidence by the, by the notarization yet, or if the IP claim desk does not have the qualified expertise to help you to make the proper decision on an infringement at the trade fair. And also, it's, if it's very obvious that the exhibitor is not the main target, um, which means they may choose a small reseller or a trading company, then it will make more sense to obtain evidence at the trade fair um, as already introduced by CESA. And then later, invest, investigate into the exhibitor after the trade fair so that more substantial targets, for example, like the manufacturer behind the exhibitor or even the whole infringing networks can be traced and it will be easier to deal with this infringement at a later stage. So um, after you collect and preserve the evidence, there are different enforcements you can choose um, besides the complaints on site at the trade fair. First is notification letter. This letter simply provides the infringer with a notice of your intellectual property rights. You may wish to um, include a statement that you would love to discuss the issue. And this is usually a less aggressive approach. It is possible to send this letter on your own without instructing any lawyer. And a more serious letter is cease and desist letter. This letter you usually threaten legal proceeding if they don't comply, if the infringer doesn't comply with what you ask, and also demand the infringer stops from infringing the intellectual property. It is possible for to ask for damages and legal costs in this letter. The letter may be accompanied by a settlement agreement, namely undertaking to contractually bind the infringer the terms of the settlement. And you should authorize a lawyer to draft, send, and follow up the, the cease and desist letter. Another enforcement action is search and cease actions, meaning the right owner can request 
uh, the local public authority authorities search and see the infringing product without informing the infringer or without alerting them. Local legal advice for this proceeding is very important because public authorities are involved in this action. And the last resort is litigation. Compared with Europe, litigations are not that costly in Latin America, China, Southeast Asia, and India. But the fees are still very significant, especially for SMEs. Both criminal and civil litigations are available for the intellectual owner um, for injunctions and damages. Next slide, please. Next slide. If you decide to choose the legal process, there are some general principles apply in different regions. Um, for instance, the burden of proof usually lies with the plaintiff, uh, usually it's the owner of and registration certificates are required to provide proof of ownership. And also the IP owner must, pro the plaintiff must, provide, must provide evidence of the infringement, which should be physical evidence, such as contract, photographs, or infringement products and proof of sale. And if you already obtain any receipts, those are also very important proceeds. However, the, the requirements of the evidence are different in different regions. For example, in China, the infringement evidence needs to be notarized by a notary public, which we already emphasized several times. Otherwise, the courts may not accept such evidence in litigation. And also, the registration certificate must be in Chinese. For, inst for, um, for instance, like the International trademark registration certificate are not in Chinese, usually it's English or Spanish or French, but not in Chinese. And in this case, we will suggest you to apply for another application with the China National Intellectual Property Administration, CNIPA, for Chinese certificate in other ones. It usually takes around one to three months to get a certificate. So please prepare that um, beforehand. And in Latin America, notarized evidence should be provided whenever possible. And as a rule of thumb, the right holder must prove ownership to enforce the right. Registration certificate is the, uh, are the best options. In countries like Chile, Brazil, or Mexico, registration certificates are mandatory for pre minute preliminary injunctions. Still in different countries in Latin America, apply different rules. So please check with the Latin America help desk or local lawyers for further advice. And in Southeast Asia, um, like in the countries like in Vietnam and Indonesia, notarized evidence should be used. And a few countries such as Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, only accept local language for official documents. Therefore, we recommend you to have the translation if the documents are in different language. Similarly, depending on which country the infringement takes place, start with the Southeast Asia help desk or local lawyer for further advice in that country. And in India, most of the evidence does not need to be notarized. However, if the evidence comes from abroad, then it should be notified. As we mentioned, most of the trade fairs in India um, do not offer intellectual property claim that. So if SMEs identify any infringement, um, you should contact the IP lawyer as soon as possible. Next slide, please. If you decide to proceed with any of the enforcement actions we mentioned, Remember that enforcement proceeding is strictly a domestic matter. So we recommend you seeking the advice of the local intellectual property lawyer in the country where you identify the infringement. Um, moreover, if you encounter any problem in the enforcement proceeding, you can always contact the corresponding help desk and check if there's any available publications. We update the publications regularly. 
And thank you. I will give the floor back to Benoit, who will guide us to apply what we have learned so far with case study. Thank you very much, Lisa, Girish, Cesar, uh, for the valuable information. We saw now the different step. Here it will be kind of a recap through a case study, something more practical. And I think we will hear again things that we were already shared by uh, Cesar Girish, Lisa, and even some uh, elements shared by Enrique earlier. So I wanted to share about the case study, uh, a bit of background of this case study. So we are talking about uh, European SME. Uh, so this is, let's say, the core, uh, uh, the core target of the help desk uh, with innovative machinery equipment, and they were selling already in several parts of the world. And, uh, this, this company was in a trade fair in Bangkok, so in Southeast Asia, quite a big one, uh, focused on the F&B industry. And uh, when discussing with them at the booth, they already were very concerned. They heard IP, it was ringing a bell. Then they tell me, yes, it's trademarks, it's designs, it, many, many things was a bit confused also in their minds. But the most important thing is that they noticed that there was a booth within the same venue at the same event uh, coming from China and selling very, very similar uh, equipment. Uh, in fact, it was identical or almost identical design of the machines, similar branding uh, with the same colors, or uh, even you could see on some parts of the machine, the real trademark, the real brand of the official uh, company from Europe. Then they also told me that they noticed that this company at the booth, they had uh, flyers, brochures, and everything was the same display of uh, their own, their own uh, uh, data, their own content. When discussing a bit further, it uh, turns out that this company was in fact an ex, a former customer, someone that was asking for too much information as uh, Cesar warned, warned us today at the webinar, you may see a lot of people just walking around the booth, asking for some questions. Sometimes it's weird questions. Sometimes it's very, very technical, very detailed questions. So very, very, very careful. And it turns out that uh, the European SME was just happy to share more information. Uh, it, this was at a previous trade fair. So they indeed, they shared information, uh, detailed information via email. And now look what happened. So there was uh, a same booth looking a bit similar to, to them. Uh, what were the action given? First, it was to investigate, uh, collect as much as possible booth information, trying to be careful, also not, uh, not say, not uh, making themselves uh, be too obvious that they're doing investigation. So this is also why sometimes it's better to just give uh, this task to more pr professional people, um, like no notaries, public notaries, or even if there are any uh, IP agent from the trade fair on, uh, on the venue. Uh, sometimes you also have some people from the customs uh, walking around, you just have to see them, uh, or staff from uh, the, the help desk. So the, 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 the task was, the main task was to collect evidence in the trade fair, also try to check with the team all the emails exchange uh, they may have with this company. The second step, very important one before doing anything, and this was already mentioned several times today, uh, check the IP protection status in the different countries, not only in Thailand, but also in all the other countries that you may uh, have an interaction with the headquarter, uh, also Southeast Asia, India, Latin America, because there are already some uh, customers in some contracts. The good news for this company is that they indeed they had uh, industrial design and also trademarks registered in Thailand. So already a big plus. Uh, this is not always the case. And the last recommendation was to contact urgently, urgently a local lawyer for preparing a seasonless letter and also preparing any further uh, step uh, in terms of enforcement, if needed. The next slide. Here we see the action taken. 
So it's just to show you that you're not alone. Uh, you just need to collect the right information, try to uh, be in contact also with the right persons. Uh, so you have a support from local public notary. This was already mentioned by Cesar. You can do some purchase, uh, notarized purchase. You can do some notarized uh, pictures, uh, a lot of statements to show that indeed there is an infringement uh, and it's visible at the trade fair, but also try to uh, save as much as possible information in a high probative way. The second part is the support of the local lawyer. The local lawyer, we have all the help desk, we have networks of lawyers uh, co collaborating with the help desk, with each help desk. So you may have access to an IP expert uh, very quickly uh, and even trying to help, try, help you on the venue, at the venue of the trade fair. And uh, the main will be to prepare a season this letter also to give you the different steps uh, on to what to do, what to avoid to do. Uh, because you, I think you understood that there are many do's and don'ts and some uh, actions can be positive, but some actions can be totally uh, destroying, uh, destroying facts and, and evidence and even uh, prevent you from uh, protecting specific rights. The third part was the support of the trade fair organizer. Uh, it's always easy to find the organizing booth. And you can also discuss with them, have the information about, uh, let's say, the registered company for this, the booth, uh, who is attending uh, at the booth, who is present. And also, you will have help from them if they have an IP office to try to remove quickly uh, the visible infringing elements in the booth. The lesson learned is a bit a recap of today, uh, what we uh, learned. Do not share valuable information, even to potential customers. As I was mentioning, NDAs, any specific written um, clauses, you have to also be aware that you're talking to someone, but there might be other people behind. Uh, protect your IP rights where you have customers, local partners. This was it's a reference of the uh, principle of territoriality that was mentioned uh, by Girish uh, and also by Enrique earlier, uh, protect your IP rights in each country, in each uh, region where you may have a distributor, where you may have a future um, business. And the last one is react promptly, be proactive, seek for local support, uh, proactively try to negotiate whenever possible with third parties. Some are really, let's say, bad, bad guys trying to uh, obtain as much as possible new customers and easy money, but some others just don't know anything about IP and they might be, uh, let's say more diligent and help, helpful if you enter into discussion with them. This has to be done, of course, uh, with the help of uh, IP lawyers. So don't act on your own. Uh, I would finish by saying that uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, help either on our website, either on by contacting us through the um, web forms that we have on the website or even via our email address. And we are ready to help within three, three days when we receive any IP question related to our regions. So just don't feel shy. There's, it's always better to ask uh, if we can even recommend you to some other of our colleagues even recommend you to some, um, let's say, official entities in the countries because we have contacts. So yes, this is very important. Uh, keep in mind our, the, the website and the different email addresses. Um, now I think it's time to discuss a bit all together. I'm sure everyone has a lot of extra information to share. I don't know, maybe we can start with uh, Enrique. Uh, if you have any useful tips, I know that uh, you were uh, willing already to share, but uh, you were saving a bit more time for, for later. Thank you, Benoit. Yes, I have uh, some, some tips uh, as a person who represents the, 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 the industry of, of tra trade fairs. Um, I, I, 
I, I think that it is convenient, very, very convenient for, for companies that uh, are uh, foreseen to participate in a trade fairs and are foreseen to, uh, to present novelties that it is uh, very inter interesting for them to understand the particularities of trade fairs uh, so that the enforcement uh, of the IPR uh, is effective as uh, Lisa has been, has been explaining us. Normally, the, the fairs, the trade fairs last a few, only a few days and also uh, usually include weekends, which can constitute a, a difficulty for exhibitors when IPR enforcement requires the intervention of public authorities. Um, a second tip uh, that I would like to, to mention is uh, to read the contractual clauses of the contract between the exhibitor and the exhibition organizer in order to see if there is any mention to, to IP, any mention to uh, procedures uh, to solve uh, um, controversies between parties uh, on inside, uh, uh, maybe uh, through arbitra arbitration, maybe through agreements uh, with the local uh, judge, uh, like in, in Barcelona, for example, in, in the mobile uh, phone uh, um, World uh, Congress. Uh, and finally, I would like to, rem to remind the importance of having a certificate of priority for exhibition. Request organizers uh, if they uh, are arbitrated to, 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 to provide this service. Not all exhibition uh, organizer, uh, organizers provide this service by uh, they should be obliged to, to, to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Enrique. I saw that we received a question for Latin America. Uh, in the meantime, don't hesitate. We still have uh, almost half an hour to continue to discuss all together. So if you have any questions, the Q&A box is here for you. So I guess it will be for Cesar. So we have, uh, thanking you for the value, valuable uh, presentation, a uh, company from Spain in October last year, they attended the textile trade fair and they show some of the design in the textile fair. Uh, can we still apply for protection of those design now? And the focus is Latin America. That's it. So I, I hope you did your homework first, but it's not that bad so far. Point is that you already released. I'm taking for granted that this trade fair was on, took place on European soil. If so, Europe registration is still open well no, no. your registration is closed anyway but you have some protection still now when it comes to latin america you have to show the products over there still i think you can benefit from this grace period protection but speaking of grace period in latin america it depends on the countries is six months so if this took place before this uh, it took place six months already or before you're absolutely unprotected. What you can do right now, if this period has not passed uh, so far, you can try to figure out whether you comply with the registration proceedings in the Latin American countries at hand. But this only means that you can reach this exclusivity. It doesn't mean that if there are no similar designs over there uh, already protected, you cannot sell them, but you won't have this exclusivity. Anyway, I'm going to let you know uh, my, my, my contact details and we can have a bilateral meeting, private for you, no limit, uh, um, no time limits, and I can elaborate a little bit more in your mother tongue. Yeah, you stress on something very important. Uh, Cesar, it's a matter of uh, timing always uh, for specific IP rights. You need to be quite proactive and react quickly. So, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I was asking myself, I hope that we, we already uh, answered. I, I see that Cesar is uh, typing the email address, I guess. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, maybe to Lisa, how does it work uh, in China in terms of official documents that you, you need to, to prepare or to have ready? Because I know that uh, you need uh, uh, Chinese uh, translation even for international trademarks that you may need mm -hmm. to bring the original or notarized uh, translations? Um, for, 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Benoit. So in China, as we already mentioned, for these international registration certificates, um, usually it's only for the master patent. First of all, copyright there is no international copyright certificate. Um, for these trademarks, or for these international IP, yes, you have to apply these Chinese certificates in other ones. Um, it's it's actually really easy, and the uh, uh, apply document is also very easy. You just need to file application along with your business registration uh, certificate, like business information certificate, and visa translation. This translation also can be done just by yourself or by a lawyer, and then file with the CNIP, which is the Intellectual Property Administration of China. And after one or three months, usually there is no problem. They will give these Chinese certificates with the stamp of this official. And then this certificate you can use in litigation, you can use in CIS, um, uh, CIS, CIS to, to inform the government to seize the products. Um, but for these certificates, usually, because you can apply multiple times, usually we will recommend you to submit the original. However, if you if the company seems too complicated to submit the original all the time, you can ask the notarized a notary public to get the notary deed of this original. Um, and then you can submit this notary deed of this original copy with um, different official several times. So yes, this is a little bit tricky in China of this Chinese certificate. I Thank hope you. I can answer. Yeah, I hope yeah. I answer your question. I know that it's uh, there are very specific things uh, in China. Uh, maybe there are any things you want to share, some tips, uh, practical uh, in India, Girish. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vanna. Uh, as I think so, Lisa had mentioned uh, earlier that most of the trade fairs in India do not have an IP booth or a relevant. Uh, Express on IP per se, but the things are changing right now. And as uh, mentioned earlier, the first thing before entering the Indian market or being in trade fairs in India would be to have uh, your rights protected. Otherwise, at least have a confidential agreements, NDA signed uh, with specific clauses mentioned. If it's a very generic NDA, Indian courts. Uh, are not very appreciative of it. Uh, Indian courts want specific clauses mentioning the prohibition of uh, um, kind of IP, uh, what do you say? Prohibition of transfer of information or something of that kind. Confidential, con confidentiality clauses should be men mentioned in specific in NDAs. This is one thing. Uh, apart from that, there are other specific nuances of uh, IP in India. Uh, at least in biotechnology sector and um, pharmaceutical sector. Uh, so these things have to be taken care of. India is very strict on uh, granting, uh, there is no second use patents and stuff. So this is uh, one thing uh, European SME should be wary of. And another specific clause with uh, respect to India is say if you have, the, there is something known as statement of working which is not per se related to trade fairs, but uh, if you have your patent protected in India, you have to make sure that the patent, the product has been used in the Indian market. It has been brought to the Indian market within the first three years. If that is not shown, your, your patent can be canceled. So this is another thing uh, which uh, uh, SMEs should be aware of. And uh, with, when it comes to novelty, it's, the novelty is strict uh, for patents it's 12 months so if you have uh, disclosed your uh, invention in uh, europe within the first 12 months you have to protect your patent in india through it be it through the pct route or through uh, the indian patent office the national route so i would uh, basically say these things are important when it comes to enforcement uh, indian courts work well so but you have to act fast you gather all the evidences that you can 
And then uh, if you have a trademark infringement, patent infringement can be a bit more complicated, but trademark infringement, if you have your rights protected, if you have your copyright certifications and even uh, design certificates, then the process is very fast. And uh, if there is a trademark inf infringement, you can have a resolution within uh, the first, within 18 months, within one, 12 to 18 months, you can have kind of a conclusive resolution of the issue. So things are picking up right now in India, even uh, with respect to patent protection, you can get your patent granted within 18 months to 24 months. And uh, even the enforcement is uh, pretty fast. But make sure before entering the Indian market, have your uh, rights protected and have uh, the specific NDA signed when you are discussing, when you're discussion or when you're collaborating with an Indian enterprise. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of cost, in terms of uh, timeline, we have, well, I think it's not updated completely, but uh, you may have already a picture uh, in our guide. We have a guide on the uh, trade fair, how to protect your IP at trade fair. Uh, we also have a lot of information on all of the different websites, the different sections. Uh, something I I want to stress on is uh, usually what we say, but maybe my colleagues will disagree or agree uh, that litigation might not be the rest, the, the best option, the right option. I don't know if, for example, Cesar, you have any tips or anything related to enforcement when it comes to us. Latin America, is it is it easy to, to enforce your rights in Latin America? It never is. I don't know any country that going to court is the best way to go. It's just kind of the, the ultimate solution you can get when almost you have nothing to lose or you're kind of desperate or you got some uh, higher interest on that. But for example, in Latin America, it's hard to find an IP specialized course so they can hardly understand the issue. And if you don't have anything on your side, you're a foreign, a foreigner, so they won't have a nice approach to you. But in case you got to go there, as mentioned, collect as many evidences as possible, even though you have to save some extra money. Because if, for example, in Brazil, you have to deposit some extra 10 to 20 uh, percent of the amount you're asking for damages. So it's like they don't trust you that much and you have to show first that you got that money. doesn't make any sense, but it is how it is. So before going to court, you better set an agreement. Actually, 90 percent of the disputes can be solved that way. And it's better than spending such an amount of money and time and all the resources and trying to solve something that at the end of the day doesn't mean that it's going to be solved maybe they give you uh a a right um decision they tell you that you're tr that, that you're right but it doesn't mean that the problem is solved maybe you have to enforce that decision uh, afterwards so if you can prevent that protect everything beforehand so you really have power to enforce something by convincing others that you're absolutely entitled to push the red button. But, and if not, the, I'd recommend not to, to go the court uh, size. Thank you. I, I also received quite a lot of questions. The same, it's like the same question when I'm going to trade first, uh, maybe my colleagues can, can share, well, it will be more for Cesar and maybe for Lisa, because uh, there are several territories covered. Uh, but when I go to trade fairs, usually I receive the, the question, oh yeah, I'm interested in Southeast Asia. Uh, then uh, is it possible to protect a patent or trademark covering the region uh, as in Africa, as in uh, European Union? Uh, and well, they're quite deceived because this, uh, beautiful system does not exist yet. So you have to go country by country in Southeast Asia. And uh, even among these countries, it's uh, the, the IP level protection is quite different. Uh, you may have different, different uh, required documents for filing your, your uh, IP rights. You may have uh, different timelines, also different mechanisms. Uh, so the advice is really to check country by country basis. Uh, I don't know if 
Lisa or Cesar, if you want to share, because you're also covering several countries. Uh, are there any things you want to flag for uh, the, the audience today? Um, I would love to share first, if it's okay. So in China, um, if you attend this, the trade fair, yes, there are many things you have to prepare, that's for sure. And except for the Chinese certificate we just mentioned, and those notarized evidence also, um, after you identify the infringement or even the certificate itself need to be notarized. So um, for those notarization, it should be done before the trade fair or after trade fair. So there are many, many um, procedures you need to proceed with. And um, yeah, so far, this is something I can think of. And maybe it's just that one to share more. Now, if you go in there, and especially during trade fairs, uh, one of the mechanisms that I highlighted was the grace period. It's a little bit different when it comes to Chile, for example, because you got to prepare all the documents beforehand. You don't have to comply with as many uh, formalities as when you go for a formal uh, pattern or design um, application, but you got to prepare that in advance. So if you're thinking about benefiting from this mechanism, it's not something that you can improvise. You got to prepare that all, see if your patent would be feasible to meet all the requirements at the end of this 12 month extra period. But it is a contrast when it comes to the rest of the countries where this grace period is kind of for free and you do it all. And then you have this 12 month period to see if you finally go away and patent. In this case, no, you got to be serious beforehand. And then after getting some minor formalities then you have this 12 month period and then after that then you can go and push the definite the definitive pattern button that's what that'd be my my recommend my my piece of advice you to bear in mind okay thank you i see that we still have a couple of minutes so feel feel free to ask uh, questions using the q a box uh i was thinking if uh, Enrique wanted to share something extra uh, on trade fairs or on maybe uh, something that uh, he saw recently by going to a trade fair or any statistics he may have. Uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of uh, like uh, Eurofair statistics, the uh, Emeka also. Well, I don't know if you have anything to share with the, the audience. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I will. I would like to highlight that uh, at least in Europe, in in my area, the more and more um, exhibition uh, organizers are aware and are very proactive in in terms of uh, protection of their exhibitors' uh, IP. And I, I have made a reference to that uh, before, uh, saying that, for example, in the in in the trade fair of Basel in Switzerland. Uh, they have uh, in, they have the rule of panels. They have several panels in order to solve uh, on on site the the controversies between exhibitors. Uh, when they sign the contract, they uh, are obliged to to submit to to the decision of the panel. I have mentioned also in Barcelona in the in the World Congress uh, World Mobile uh, Congress uh, where the, there is an agreement between. The Ministry of Justice and uh, and the, the organizers in order in order to facilitate a quick or fast uh, judgments by by fast decision uh, decisions by uh, by the judge uh, in order to the enforcement of of IP and uh, in 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 other uh, exhibition fairs like Madrid or Valencia also they they have. Uh, they have been aware for a long time and they are little by little uh, implementing these, these services. Okay, thank you very much. So I guess the most important is also to stay updated because IP intellectual property is moving. Uh, also the trade fair industry is moving. Uh, so yes, it's try to get the information by registering to uh, the newsletters. Um, I see that it's almost time to conclude. So I wanted to share uh, on the next slide uh, a quite important piece of information. Uh, if we can go to the next next slide. Yeah. 
So it's a joint uh, publication that uh, we did uh, uh, with the help desk, and it's to give you, let's say, all the handy tips uh, for that were already shared. Most, most of them were shared today, but there are so much uh, to say. Uh, how to protect your IP before, uh, how to be vigilant when you're in a trade fair, and also some case studies, a lot of recommendations, and some links. Uh, well, it's always important. All these, this publication is part of a very large library, and we all have each help desk has a library of updated uh, or being updated uh, fact sheets covering countries. Uh, of uh, guides on specific rights on specific topics, like for example, the trade fair or e-commerce or thing like this. So please have a look uh, at, at uh, these uh, beautiful libraries. Uh, we are all almost to the end. I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, Enrique for giving us uh, this, the, the overview of IP, the link, very important link to the trade fairs, uh, we will uh, remember the right of priority, the Paris Union uh, Agreement, and the different type of uh, exhibitions. So this is very useful information. Uh, then we had Girish. Thank you very much, Girish. All the preparation phase before attending the trade fair is not just packing your business cards. As was saying uh, Cesar, you need to pack much more things. Uh, then we had Cesar. Thank you also for uh, sharing all your uh, information and all the tips. Uh, be proactive. Uh, I guess use common sense. Also, don't be in a rush. Uh, this is what I, I I took I took some notes. And uh, of course, the disclosure in the novelty part. And last but not least, we had uh, say the the part on enforcement shared by Lisa. Uh, so also thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Uh, how to uh, deal with the evidence? How to deal with the official documents? The different routes that you can activate for enforcement. Uh, this is all for today. Uh, the International Head Desk, uh, thank you for uh, attending this uh, webinar and uh, well, wish you a good end of the day or let's say continue the day either in Europe or in Asia. And uh, well, stay in touch for uh, the next webinars, either joint or with all with each Head Desk. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and uh, well, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit. Bye. Thank you.